William Wyler's career was one of the greatest success stories in motion pictures. Almost 50 years of distinguished filmmaking. He made 37 feature films and the movie industry honored him more than any director in its history. Three Academy Awards, 12 nominations for directing, and another three for producing. Wyler was interviewed for this film in July of 1981. He died three days later. This is a portrait of the man and his work. It's wonderful in having a director that has a very strong presence. You know, I wanted to please him. I wanted him to like it. I wanted him to like me. Actors uh, love to work with Willie. And I think that probably one of the reasons is because uh, he directed more Academy Award winning performances than I think almost any other director. I owed all that. I owed so much thinking in my life since to Wyler. So much thinking. He had a, a wonderful taste, a splendid judgment. If uh, Willie Wyler told me to jump in the Hudson River, I would. I would have done anything he asked me. He was the classiest picture maker, I think, that ever lived. It's a mystery. It's an utter mystery to me. Where Willie got it. Willie Wyler was born in 1902 in Alsace-Lorraine in a town called Malouz. When he was 18, his father tried to interest him in the family business, a clothing store. But his mother took him to meet Carl Lemley, her famous cousin who had gone to America and founded Universal Studios. And Uncle Carl, as he was called, changed Willie's life forever. As we were talking, he said, how would you like to come to America? I was thunderstruck because at those days it was like make a trip to the moon. He said, I'll give you a job, and from then on, you're on your own. He deducted $5 a week from my salary to pay for the boat trip. Well, that's how I came to America. I had no idea of going into the moving picture business. After a year in the New York office, he told Uncle Carl that he wanted to go to Hollywood. In the early 1920s, Hollywood was a boom town full of excitement, gambling, and romance. Willie, with his boundless energy, fit right in. By this time, I was interested in the making of films. When I asked to become a director, I told Carl Lemley about it, and he called in the supervisor of Westerns and said, this boy wants to become a director. And the supervisor of Westerns said, well, it's fine, but he's not ready yet. First, I had to get promoted from fourth assistant to third assistant to second assistant to first assistant. Finally, they gave me a tour of Western, and it turned out all right. You see, in those days, it was like a school making little westerns because they all demanded action. And the basis of motion pictures is really action. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you shot the picture. Sometimes a few shots be left over for Thursday, but then Friday, you'd get a new script. Saturday, you cast it, then Monday, you start shooting. The budget was $2,000 for the whole picture. The stories were all very elementary. There was a villain and a leading man and a girl. No sex, nothing like that. Couldn't even kiss the girl till the last shot in the picture. Then he could kiss the girl. During the next three years, Weiler directed 27 two-reel and five-reel westerns. He learned his craft. Then it was an easy jump to feature films. In his early 30s, after a 12-year apprenticeship, Willie won his spurs directing America's greatest living actor, John Barrymore, in Counselor at Law. Good morning, Senator. Yeah, fine. Thanks. Thanks very much. That's the way with those murder cases, a lot of publicity and no money. Yes, yes, I did. As I explained to you, a decrease of two cents a pound will put my clients out of business. Don't get so excited, Senator. There's nothing illegal about lobbying, you know. If they're worried, have to lock up half the people in Washington. No, I'm not trying to block the entire bill. I'm merely acting in the interest of my clients as you're acting in the interest of the people of Montana. Come in, Mr. Russo, now. Listen, Senator, why don't you hop in the midnight sleeper and have lunch with you tomorrow? 12.30 at the lawyer's club, fine. And give my regards to that charming daughter he was. Make a transcript of that, send it right around to Colonel Wertheimer. Morning, Mr. Rue. Oh, Rexy, you better cut out that stuff about the murder cases, you know. And get me Mr. Vanderbilt get on the phone right away. Have a chocolate cream. Uh oh, I'm on a diet, but if you get a cigarette. Sure, there they are. Help yourself. Thanks. There's a salmon on the phone. Oh, excuse me a minute. Sure. Hello, Hello darling. The great profile had a reputation for being difficult, so the film's success enhanced Weiler's reputation. His reward was directing Universal's ethereal new star, Margaret Sullivan, in The Good Fairy. She was an important star at Universal when I was a very young director. She had a special gift with being very attractive. They clashed fiercely on the set, but made up privately at night. As soon as the picture was finished, they married. But it was not a happy match. Within two years, they divorced. In 1935, 
Weiler met an independent producer who had his own studio and a reputation for toughness and quality. Samuel Goldwyn offered Weiler a seven-year contract. I jumped at the opportunity because I'd just come from Universal making sort of second-class pictures, and Goldwyn was making first-class pictures. And I was told he wanted to make The Children's Hour. The Children's Hour was a controversial play with whisperings of lesbianism. In those days, censorship was very strict, and that's where I met Lillian Hellman. She wrote a very fine script, and she is the one who explained to me that the theme of the picture is not lesbianism. It's not about lesbianism, it's about a lie. And I happened to pick what I thought was a very strong lie. There are many other kinds of lies. Well, it was late at night, and Miss Dobie's room was right next to ours, and... Mary! Do you know what you're saying? I had to change the title and never mention Children's Hour, because that was all part of the censorship requirements of the day. The picture we made was more a conventional triangle. And one night you were in Miss Doby's room late. Why did you think it was wrong for me to be in Miss Doby's room? Be because... Because it was at night and I was leaning down by the keyhole and I saw things and I got scared and then you left and... and, and Ask her again how she could see us. I was leaning down by the keyhole. There's no keyhole on my door. What? That was the beginning of the Goldwyn Weiler relationship. Of course, he was the most important producer in my career. They say one day it's a Weiler touch, next day it's a Goldwyn touch. You end up not knowing whose touch it was. I had a scene where Dorl McRae was in an outfit of a bee hunter. Anyway, I got stung by a bee. Next day, the publicity department had it that Goldwyn was stung by a bee. <laughs> uh, I didn't care, only I wish it had been true. <laughs> Weiler's uncommonly good ear for dialogue led him to some of the finest writers of his time. An adaptation of Sinclair Lewis's Dodsworth got him his first Academy Award nomination. I hadn't realized it was your birthday. No, wish I hadn't. No woman enjoys getting to be 35. When you're my age, you'll look back on 35 as a most agreeable time of life, Mrs. Dodsworth. I hope I look as young as you do uh, when I'm your age. You're almost sure to, my dear. After Dodsworth, Weiler was on a roll, and Goldwyn offered him another Broadway hit, Dead End. Lillian Hellman wrote the screenplay. Dead End was about a slum district in an upper-class neighborhood. And Willie had quite rightly littered the street with garbage and gar garbage cans. And go and wander down the set and said, it's a disgusting-looking, filthy set. He said to Wilder, clean it up. Just clean it up. I won't have it. Goldwyn was always, how should I say, his pictures, he wanted his pictures to be clean and glamorous. All the women looking beautiful, the hair just in place, you know, so you can see the hairdresser work and the makeup man and the clothes, everything speak and span. And, well, uh, not all pictures lend themselves to that. <laughs> Between projects, Goldwyn loaned Weiler out to other studios. Willie really is responsible for the fact that I became a box office star. Jezebel was really the first one. Bring that over here. Mm, Saucy, isn't it? And vulgar. Yes, isn't it? Come on, get me out of this. Julie, what are you doing? If it fits me, I'm going to wear it to the Olympus Bowl. A red dress to the Olympus Bowl while you're out of your senses. Mademoiselle Jeanne ne porte pas une robe comme ça. D'ailleurs, c'est une robe de cette Marie Vicaire. That creature, Julie. You heard what Madame Poulard said. That infamous Vickers woman. Mary Vickers couldn't possibly do it justice. Child, you're out of your mind. You know you can't wear red to the Olympus Ball. Can't I? I'm going to. This is 1852, Dumplin. 1852, not the Dark Ages. Girls don't have to simper around in white just because they're not married. In New Orleans, they do. Julie, you'd insult every woman on the floor. Mademoiselle, your aunt, she's right. Look how beautiful this dice is. Will you kindly get me out of this? Surely you can't be serious. Never more serious in my life. He was an amazingly inarticulate man about what he wanted. He really, when he saw it, 
he knew that's what he wanted. But it was very hard for him to say. He would just say, we'd do it again. Willie would have his cast probably run a scene three or four times. He would just sit there having coffee and donuts every morning. Then he would get up and he would say, I like this you did, I like that you did, unless he ran into an actor who was incompetent. And then he was not very tolerant. He always said, I do not run an acting school. <laughs> In the ballroom scene, she was supposed to be wearing a red dress, and this was before color pictures. So I chose a black satin dress, which was shiny, but they seemed to accept it. Hello, Molly. Miss Kendrick, hello, Dick. It's Steve and Jelly. Stephanie, we must pay our respects to Miss Zimmer. You'll excuse us, please. Mm. They waltz scene. In the script, that said, Julie goes to the Comus Ball, and the assistant scheduled it for one day, and we were on that scene for one week and a half. Betty and I had a very good relationship. I was very happy working with her. He never, ever said whether he liked a take or not. So after about a week of this, I went up to him, and I said, I just have to know if I'm pleasing you in any way. <laughs> so the entire next day, <laughs> after every scene, he would go, marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. So after about three of these, I said, please go back to your old ways. I can't stand it. <laughs> Bye, Julie. Is that all you've got to say to me? There's nothing more to say. Evidently, you've made up your mind. No, Julie. You've made up my mind. Goodbye, Press. Bye, Julie. In 1938, Weiler directed some musical sequences in a Goldwyn film featuring violinist Yasha Heifetz. An amateur fiddler himself, Weiler couldn't resist switching roles with the renowned virtuoso. One day, an aspiring actress from Dallas visited the set. And we met. And after a little bit, he said, um, do you like to look at tennis? And I said, yes, I like to look at tennis. And um, we went to the tennis matches, and we went to the tennis matches every day, and we saw each other every evening. And insanely, 10 days later, we decided to get married. It's been difficult afterwards telling my children to uh, wait carefully to get to know people well. <laughs> it's been hard. <laughs> But I don't know, it was just the feeling that I had. I didn't plan to give up my career after I married. I think Willie was much too smart to say that. And after my first child was born, Kathy, I did go back to work, and I began to think, well, what's so great about this? You're sitting on a dark soundstage all day long, waiting. The whole thing just sort of petered away absolutely painlessly, and I've never regretted it. I was very lucky to find her. I didn't look among the movie stars, although she was a starlet. She even made a test for Gone with the Wind. But I was lucky she didn't get the part. <laughs> Wuthering Heights, the timeless love story established Laurence Olivier as a leading man in films. He made me a good film actor by teaching me in an extremely rough, insulting way that I don't know who I thought I was, but I wasn't. Kathy. Heathcliff. Why did you stay so long in that house? Didn't expect to find you here. Why did you stay so long? Why? Because I was having a wonderful time. 
A delightful, fascinating, wonderful time among human beings. Go and wash your face and hands, Heathcliff. And comb your hair so that I needn't be ashamed of you in front of a guest. They were shooting one particular scene over and over again, and finally, Olivia would come to him and says, look, Willie, for God's sake, we, have been, we did that thing 60 times. I did it standing up, I did it sitting down, I did it fast, I did it slow. How do you want me to do it? And Wilder just said, better. I was overacting a porn and doing some extravagant gesture. And he'd say, keep stopping me, for Christ's sake, what do you think you're doing? You think you're at the Opera House? Manchester or something, what are you doing? Well, come down to earth, come on. I want and I want it, so I know you mean it. Forgive me, Heathcliff. Forgive me. Make the world stop right here. Make everything stop and stand still and never move again. Make the moors never change and you and I never change. The moors and I will never change. Don't you, Kathy? I can't. I can't. No matter what I ever do or say, Heathcliff, this is me now. Standing on this hill with you, this is me forever. He was Olivier Goldwyn said, this actor here, if he goes on playing like that, I'm going to call off the picture. Look at him. He's, he's filthy. He's dirty. I said, he's playing a stable boy, you know? I can remember being waked at night by Willie thrashing around in bed, grinding his teeth, and he finally woke up and he said he was arguing with Goldwyn. <laughs> so this was going on 24 hours a day. Goldwyn said, I don't like to see, look at dead people at the end of a picture. So he wanted me to shoot a scene of the two of them walking through the clouds. I said, I just won't do it. Well, he had somebody else do it. He got two doubles shot from the back. That shot is still in the picture. It's awful. We had a sort of a love-hate relationship. We'd have fights. But the fights were not over money. They were over what I just said, you know, by matters of taste. And once Goldwyn was committed, he was a generous producer. I mean, he had a great deal of pride in the pictures he produced. On another loan out to Warner Brothers, Weiler filmed Somerset Mom's story of jealousy and revenge, establishing the mood of the entire picture in one seamless shot. The opening shot of a letter was in a rubber plantation near Singapore and a set was built. So I devised a very complex shot, complex and also limited because we were on a sound stage and couldn't shoot in every direction. Today they'd go to Singapore and, and <laughs> go to a real rubber plantation. Maybe it would be better, maybe it wouldn't be as good. Mr. Wyler could be very rough in insisting on what he wanted. Leslie, tell me, now, this minute, do you love me? Yes, I do. There was one serious fight on the letter over the reading of a single line. Wyler wanted Davis to speak the climactic words looking her husband directly in the eyes. The actress insisted that her character would turn away. What is it? With all my heart, I still love the man I killed. It's the one time I left the stage, but I came back. Uh, at the AFI award ceremony. I remember one line of dialogue. We disagreed strongly on how it should be read. Even today, 37 years later, we still disagree on it. <laughs> 
Yes, that was the one big, big difference of opinion. And I still think I was right. I think I was right, but she, I'm sure Betty thinks she was right. And I wouldn't be surprised if right now I told her to come out to Warner Brothers Studio, we'll shoot the scene over her way, she would come. <laughs> he was as mischievous as anybody I knew, and it was full of fun, too. He was willing to do anything. That was what made him such fun. He used to take me to work on a motorcycle. He would call for me at my house, and we'd go zooming around Hollywood, and zooming in and out of cars. He was a madman on his madman on his motorcycle, madman in those downhill things he did in Europe. No, he was very much sort of a wild man that way. He would ski like mad. He just got on him and came down without any of the, of the techniques that we had taught today in ski school. Well, he loved thrills. Well, he was a great man walking a narrow ledge at a dizzy height. <laughs> and anything that had uh, a touch of uh, challenge to it, why, Willie rose to. He was a, a very uh, able, quick man with his body. He had fine coordination. Back on the Golden Lot, Weiler and Betty Davis collaborated a third time on Lillian Hellman's tale of greed in the Old South, The Little Foxes. She plays a woman as a daughter, 19 or 20. Actually, she wasn't even 40, she was in her late 30s. So she tried to play old and nasty. As regards the playing of Regina, he just wanted her sort of done more subtly. And she wasn't a subtle woman to me at all. She was right out and out. I've always been lucky. I'll be lucky again. The bottle. Please, upstairs, in my room, in the drawer. The main thing in the scene is not the man trying to go upstairs to get the medicine. It's Betty Davis sitting on a couch, and it's all going on behind her. There was another thing about this scene that nobody knows. Herbert Marshall, who played the man, has a wooden leg and cannot run up the stairs. So he walks out of the scene, and a double comes in. He starts going up the stairs, but he's so far in the background, you can't tell who he is. Willie was a joy. Willie left you alone and, you know. And he said things like, don't bother with the shots. I know about the shots, just do the dialogue. You know, don't tell me where to put the camera and I don't know that. This is heaven. When the opportunity came, I jumped at it because it was a propaganda film in a way for our entry into the war against Hitler. You were not supposed to make propaganda pictures. You were supposed to make commercial pictures. Mrs. Miniver, the character, was plucked out of the, edit, off the editorial pages of the London Times newspaper. She was a popular character. She had her little life and all the amusing things that happened. And then they showed her suddenly with her quiet, peaceful life completely disrupted and shattered by uh, the horrors of the total blitz. In Mrs. Miniver, there was a, a scene of a German pilot who had been shot down over England. And he was discovered by Mrs. Miniver. And this boy seemed to be quite decent and frightened and so on. Well, I got the writers together and we changed the scene to make him one of Mr. Goering's little monsters. And 
in the course of this project, I got a call from Louis B. Mayer. He'd heard about what I was doing, said, you know, we don't hate anybody, we're not in the war. We... I said, Mr. Mayor, if I had several Germans in the film, I wouldn't mind having one decent young fellow. But I've only got one German. And if I make this picture, this one German is going to be a typical little Nazi son of a bitch. Pearl Harbor happens. Now we're in the war. I get a call from Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor says, I've been thinking about what you said. <laughs> Pearl Harbor came to my rescue. We will come. We will bomb your cities, like Barcelona, Warsaw, Narvik, Rotterdam. Rotterdam we destroy in two hours. And thousands killed. Innocent people. Not innocent. They were against us. Women and children. 30,000 in two hours. And we will do the same thing here. I remember coming out of Mrs. Miniver in the rejection room and crying. And he said, what are you crying for? And I said, because it's such a piece of junk, Willie. And you ought to be so ashamed of yourself. It's such a piece of junk. It's so below you. Hellman's opinion was not shared by the rest of the country. Mrs. Miniver was the most honored film of the year, winning six Oscars, including one for Weiler. Thanks so much, everybody. It makes me very happy to accept the award for Willie. I wish he could be here. He's wanted an Oscar for a long time. And I know it would thrill him an awful lot to be here, probably as much as that fight over Willems often did. Thank you so much. Weiler was 40 years old when he enlisted in the Army Air Corps. He was wild to get involved in this and get to Europe because he felt violently anti-Hitler. He wanted to be a part of the struggle and also because simply by nature, he wasn't about to miss all that that was going on. I was European and Jewish and I didn't enlist as an ordinary soldier. I enlisted as a filmmaker, see if I could make a film that would help the war effort in some small way, and that's what I did. Willie was a fearless man, or if, if he had qualms, why, well, he certainly didn't reveal them. I doubt that he had any. This was a documentary film called The Memphis Bell, which was the name of the B-17, the flying fortress in which I flew with its crew. A staff are lurking behind that cloud, or hiding up in the sun where the glare blinds you, and you can't see them, waiting to dive down on you. Fighters at six o'clock. This is what a gunner sees, a speck in the sky. That's a fighter. And then a blink. That means he's firing at you. 2,300 rounds a minute. Try to get all this on film, you forget that they're shooting at you at the same time. We had to learn aircraft recognition. So we would shoot at enemy planes and not at our own. You had to be able to take over a machine gun and operate it in 65 below zero weather. I'm on him. Come on, you son of a bitch. It's such a noisy plane, I wasn't prepared uh, for all that. And uh, I went deaf. And then it turns out that he has totally lost the hearing in one ear, and it is impaired in the other. They shipped me home from Italy on a, on, on a, on a surface vessel, not, not by plane. But, uh, well, it could, there were a lot worse cases than, than mine. He really wasn't sure what that would do to him, whether he would be able to continue as a director if he couldn't hear. I have never seen anybody in such a real state of horror in my life as that he never would direct again. And of course, he did direct for many years again. I devised a very simple thing. When I sit by the camera, I have a connection with the sound man and comes to me and I hear what the microphone hears. So I'm, uh, sometimes I hear them talking about me, you know, quietly. <laughs> When I came back, I was still full of the war, and although I was now out of it, I wanted to do something that had something to do with my experience. 
I was still under contract to Sam Goldwyn. I had one picture left for him to do under my contract. Just as Mrs. Minerva rallied a nation going off to war, the best years of our lives welcomed the nation home in all its pain and glory. It was the film closest to Weiler's heart, and the entire country embraced it. It won Willie his second Oscar, another award for best picture under his direction, and it was big box office. Hey, there's Butch's place. Butch's? Who's that? Gosh, Butch has got himself a neon sign. Have you ever been to Butch's place? No. Well, Butch Engel that runs it, he's my uncle. Swell guy. Well, the family don't think he's respectful because he sells liquor. <laughs> Very often we do pictures we don't know our subject well enough. Uh, and in this case, I, I knew my subject. I had, I learned it the hard way. And, uh, and somehow when you have, when you get personally involved in the story, something gets on the screen that makes it uh, human and real. And you can't put your finger at what it is, but it's the director's personal involvement. Say, how about the three of us going back to Butch's place? We'll have a couple of drinks and then we can go home. You're home now, kid. Well, so long. So, so long, Homer. Where next? Just a minute, bud. This is the only thing I've ever seen where the picture started, and three minutes later I was dissolved in tears, and 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 I cried for for two hours plus uh, after that, and that was the the, the opening sequence in in uh, best years of our lives. The moment that that guy without his without his arms was standing there with the back to the camera and the parents came out, I was gone, and I'm not I'm not the pushover, believe me. I laugh at Hamlet. Harold Russell, who played the man who lost his hands, he never went overseas. He lost them in training. We preferred to have somebody who was not an actor, but who had really lost his hands. And here was an opportunity to use this boy, and he was very good. The picture told uh, on several levels what was going on. It was universal in its significance. It happened when I, when I returned from the war and, and uh, my wife met me in New York. It was at the Plaza Hotel. I opened the door of the room and Willie was walking down the hall and there was this long hall and we met. It was just a little unusual. We had to run to each other. So I thought I'd repeat that. It's no great invention now, but it made the scene very effective. That's the enigma of, of Weiler. He was not a particularly uh, well-read man. As a matter of fact, he hated reading. He was not a particularly studious man. He had, he had no idea about Strasbourg methods, about uh, Russian uh, theater, about... Uh, no, he just... There was an instinct in him that told him when it was right, when it felt true. A genius for getting the truth out of an actor, getting his very best performance, a very a most sophisticated thing that Willie was after. 
there was a finesse in that guy which you would not expect if you, if, if you, if you just uh, talked to him across the card table, where you talk to him most of the time. Being married to a director like me, I think, is not easy because during the making of a picture, you get so involved, this very little home life. It was as if Willie dove into a deep pool of water and he was about 15 feet deep under there. I can see him vaguely and I try to commu communicate with him by shouting, but I don't get much response back. We try to make up for it between pictures. I never went from one picture to another very quickly. We'd always take a trip somewhere to make up for lost time. When Willie finished a picture, he had a wonderful ability of loving not to work. We traveled, we vacationed, and we would go to Europe on a long trip, and only at the end of, oh, two or three months, he would have the nagging feeling that he better get back to work and support his family again. Everything seems to have come out all right. We had four children, and they are all fine. He had a string, an unparalleled string of, of hits after hit after hit. So sometimes, you know, when I started directing and people don't quite listen, while or while, the, much to my delight, they confused the two of us. And he would put the arm around me and says, come on now, money, money, who cares? It was a long time ago, about 30 years ago, that I acted for him only once in the film The Heiress. The Goldwyn contract finished, Weiler became his own producer. All decisions were now his alone, down to the smallest detail. He was very uncertain about my makeup. In fact, James says that the doctor has a beard, so we made some tests. He didn't like this beard. He says it's too round, I think. Right? So every night we went and watched the various tests of the beard, but he couldn't quite make up his mind. He said it should be square, I think. Don't you think square? I said it could be, it could be square. Or it could be, no, I said. It, finally, he said, we must either have a round beard or we must have a square beard. Is that understood by everyone? And everyone said, yes, I understood. For the last evening, he came down and he watched. He said, I've got it, I've got it, Ralph, I've got it, everyone. Ralph's beard shall be square but round. First scene we made was a simple shot of Ralph coming in a door, hanging up his hat and coat, playing. He said to me, how would you like me to do this? I said, well, there's not many ways of doing it. Then he showed me about, I don't know, eight or 11 ways, and it was like a symphony each time, so effortless, and each one a little bit different. Oh, Father. Have you waited up for me? Yes, Father, I, I have something to tell you. William says very little. He's not a very eloquent man, but he's an amazingly imaginative man. Well, I suppose you'll be going off with him any time now. Yes, if he will have me. Why not? You'll be a most entertaining companion. I will try to be. And your gaiety and brilliance will make up the difference between the 10,000 a year you will have and the 30,000 he expects. He expects nothing. He does not love me for that. No? What else, then? Your grace, your charm, your quick tongue and subtle wit. He admires me. Catherine, I've tried for months not to be unkind, but now it's time for you to realize the truth. How many girls do you think he might have had in this town? He finds me pleasing. Oh, yes, I'm sure he does. A hundred women are prettier, a thousand more clever, but you have one virtue that outshines them all. What is that? Your money. Father. You have nothing else. Oh. What a terrible thing to say to me. I don't expect you to believe that. I've known you all your life, and I've yet to see you learn anything. With one exception, my dear. You embroider neatly. I'm being accused constantly of being, of having no signature. You know, it's a very big artistic uh, demerit. Yeah, I have no sickness because <coughs> you cannot tell a Weiler film from a, another man's films by just looking at it. To me, it's more challenging and more fun, too, 
to do different types of pictures. In Roman Holiday, I had Gregory Peck, who had agreed to do the film. So there was a British director. I asked him to shoot a test of Audrey Hepburn and then conspire with the cameraman and the sound man when he says, cut, scene's finished, that they do not cut. Well, this director did it just right. She jumped out of bed. She said, well, how was it? At this moment, she was at her most attractive. And I said, this is the girl. His attitude was that only simplicity and the truth counts. It has to come from the inside. You can't fake it. That is something I learned from him. 8.30, breakfast here with the embassy staff. 9 o'clock, we leave for the Polinari Automotive Works, where you'll be presented with a small car. Thank you. Which you will not accept. No, thank you. 10.35, inspection of food and agriculture organization will present you with an olive tree. No, thank you. Which you will accept. Thank you. Willie was a great, famous director when I met him, but I didn't really know much about directors. Gregory Peck I knew about. And to do a movie with him, you can imagine what my first picture, what that felt like, you know. We all knew that this was going to be an important star, and we began to talk uh, off camera <laughs> about the chance that she might win an Academy Award in her first film. Every year I appreciate more that I did receive it. The story itself was very thin. It was an episode in the life of a princess, a Cinderella story in reverse, but uh, but certainly everything in it represented Willie's humor, Willie's sense of romance. It was Wyler all the way. The mouth of truth. The legend is that if you're given to lying, you put your hand in there, it'll be bitten off. Oh, the hard idea. Let's see you do it. with comedy were particularly marvelous. The European sensibility and, uh, and also a fellow who was 100% uh, American, a rare combination. There was the one scene that required tears because I had to leave Greg and go back to my palace. I had no idea how to come by these tears. I mean, I'd acted so little. I'm going to that corner there and turn. You must stay in the car and drive away. Promise not to watch me go beyond the corner. And the night was getting longer and longer, and Willie was waiting, and... And out of the blue, he came over to the car and gave me hell. He said, look, we can't stay here all night if you're not going to... Can't you cry, for God's sake? I mean, you know? <gasps> Willie had never spoken to me like that, ever, you know, during the picture, and I broke into such sobs, and he shot the scene, and that was it. I don't know how to say goodbye. I can't think of any words. Don't try it. And he said, I'm sorry afterwards, but I had to get you to do it somehow. In the mid-50s, Weiler helped found the Committee for the First Amendment a group protesting McCarthyism. His films emphasized his basic humanity. Just because Quakers are people of peace, that doesn't mean that they're weak or soft. The principal character in Friendly Persuasion refuses to fight according to Quaker principles. He goes as far as picking up a gun. Taking that gun, and not shooting when you're protecting your own life. 
is as great a sign of strength than shooting it. And that's the whole point. Go on, get. I'll not harm thee. The trouble with Quakers is that there aren't enough of them. In the big country, Weiler backtracked to the westerns he had directed in his early days and came up with some new variations on the themes of honor and manliness in the Old West. Big country was debunking the showing off part of cowboys and western cliches, you know. It came in very handy. I used to spend nights trying to think of new ways of getting on or off a horse. One of the key scenes in Big Country, of course, was the fight between me and Greg Peck. I don't know how well Greg understood. I know I didn't understand why it was that he was shooting so much of it from way up in a ridge. And I thought, I don't know what lens he has on, but we can't be larger than ants in that frame. And I thought, he's just doing this to be mean. He can't use this footage. And of course, in the final scene, he uses those long shots very often to underscore again and again the futility of violence. The producer of Ben-Hur came to me and said, uh, how about doing Ben-Hur? I thought it would be intriguing to see if I could make a Cecil B. DeMille picture. So I took on the job. It was in line with my desire to make every kind of picture. Also, I thought this picture could make lots of money, you know, and maybe I'll get some of it, <laughs> which I did. There probably has never been a director who had as little respect for the idea of film as art or directing as uh, an artist's undertaking or, uh, God knows, not acting. <laughs> Ben-Hur was the most physically demanding film of Weiler's career. Just as tough was the artistic challenge of creating an epic with a cast of thousands while moving an audience on a personal level. He succeeded. Ben-Hur did blockbuster business and won more Academy Awards than any movie in history, including Weiler's third Oscar. At one point, quite early in the shooting, he called me in and he said, Chuck, you have to be better in this part. And I said, okay, what, uh, what is it you have in mind? He said, I don't know, but you're not good enough. And I said, well, that's kind of hard to deal with, Willie. He said, I know, but I thought I should tell you. He said, it's awfully hard to make this fella come off plausibly, and uh, you're not doing it yet. And I said, you can't give me any uh, specific uh, advice on this. He said, nope, he's just got to be better. <laughs> Charlton Heston, Ben Hur. You, I said no word for him. The sort of subtitle of Ben Hur is a tale of the Christ. It was one of the things that really was a challenge, and to portray the Christ is something that's a bit scary, you know, when he may be the best known man who ever lived. So I staged all the scenes with him in such a way that you only saw the back of his head, and you saw the way other people reacted to him. You think you saw him, you think you heard his voice, but you didn't really. All right, on your feet, all of you. He was relentless in his determination to get the best you could give in the scene. And he wouldn't quit until he was, I hesitate to say satisfied, but resigned to the fact that you weren't going to be any better. Willie did more than five or six takes, but uh, the myth of the 40, 50 takes, in my experience, is not true. Uh, I've heard Betty Davis uh, carry on at considerable length about the 40 and 50 takes, and uh, it may be so. Uh, he made me do 48 takes in front of 250 extras. <clears throat> and I had never in my life done more than two takes, ever. The most we ever did in any scene I was in was 27 takes. He would go on to take 63, saying, that was lousy. Do it again. Somehow or other, the number 71 comes out of the mists of memory. I, I can't think that that's possible. I make six, eight takes, and it turns out to be 40. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's true that, uh, that I would make 
as many takes as were necessary to get the scene, to get it good. During each take, his, his requirements would get a little more severe. Actors would sometimes say to Willie, what do you want? He wouldn't tell them. It was too difficult to tell. It would be some value so fine that it would drown in, its, in the discussion of it. Someone sent him this book of The Collector, which was so different and so intense and so emotional. And he kind of just came really close to me and he said, I'm not making the book. <laughs> I said, what are you making? He said, I'm making a love story. Yes, it was a love story in actual fact. <laughs> I'm an art student. He abducts me. Then it's the psychological drama of a captor and the captive. The only other thing is sex. It's not that at all. I shall have all the proper respect. Then why am I here? I want you to be my guest. Your guest? I don't want to be your guest! He wanted a kind of constant terror from her. That's, you know, really very difficult to act. So he said to me, off the set, I don't want you to be friends with her. You know, I don't want you to talk to her. I don't want you to be nice to her. We'll just, you know, this is going to look cruel, but we'll get a great performance out of her. There were certain tactics, I'm sure, uh, that he had in mind. He and I tortured her. That was how we worked. Well, he never gave me a word of praise for about two and a half months. After that, I got the Oscar nomination. I figured that he didn't really speak English. That's what I figured. I thought he's from Alsace. He's grown up speaking French. He's, he's not a man who expresses himself easily in English. However, if he wanted to say something, I remember the character goes back to the bank where he worked before he won the fortune. And just before the take, you know, in that moment when you're sort of open to it, he just sidled up to me and said, um, the taste of the stamps. That's the kind of direction that every actor needs. One of the last pictures I made was Funny Girl. I'd never made a music. Now I feel like the man who's done everything. <laughs> I was very fortunate to have Willie as my first director. He knew when it was right. Hello, gorgeous. He was wonderful, because he was, he was the audience. I just knew he knew when it was right. And he couldn't tell you how to do it differently. He would just tell you, do it again. Of course, I was fortunate. I had played the role about a 1,000 times. I didn't have to tell her how to sing a song. I didn't have to tell her how to act this part, because she knew it better than I. I mean. <laughs> Uh, this, this girl knows her stuff. It's what the director wants the audience to see. What he feels about the people in the film, that's what's going to come out. I think Willie was proud of me. Willie wanted to show me off. That's why my performance came out as well as it did. Hold it, Eddie. Hold it! You, with the skinny legs. You, yes, you, with the bloomers. Yeah. You're fired. What? You call that a replacement? What's the matter, Eddie? Did you owe somebody a favor? It seemed like a funny idea. What's funny about it? What do I say? Everybody back at four. Yeah, but, but, but listen, Mr. Keeney, uh, wait a minute. You're making a mistake. I've had a lot of experience, honest. I, uh, I've been on the stage since I was 10. Um, amateur contests, uh, Gottlieb Southern Repertory, uh, professional companies. Last season, last season, I doubled six parts. I played a daughter and her own father. How do you like that? A 60-year-old Indian chief. Listen, girl. How? <laughs> please, you've got to face facts. You don't look like the other girls. I know, You've but... got skinny legs. You stick yeah, out. Yeah, but... And you are out. Yeah, but I'm, to... I'm just trying to tell I'm you sorry, something. Why don't you just give me a chance? Out. 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 He would ruin a lot of takes, Willie, because he would smoke and cough. 
The smoke would come in front of the lens, you know, and the cough would ruin the soundtrack. I made the decision to retire because I'd worked 50 years, and I thought that was enough. And he stopped, and although he had offers, he never took one. Contrary to what people think, I've not stopped making films. My wife and I do a great deal of traveling. In our travels, I'm never without my super 8 millimeter movie camera, complete with zoom lens, slow motion, single frame, and all the other innovations. It's a case of professional turned amateur. I used to sit in the car and nag him for half an hour at a time to do another movie. And he finally put his hand over his one good ear and say, oh, please let me alone. I don't intend to work anymore. Please be still. About two or three years after he stopped working, one morning he came down to breakfast and said, I had the most awful dream last night. And I said, my God, darling, what? And he said, I dreamed I was directing a movie again. <laughs> my next picture, <laughs> going home. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.